welcome to the Libertarian Alliance meeting. We meet in the third uh, Tuesday of every month. Uh, and tonight we have uh, Sean Gabb, uh, who's going to talk on the value of tradition. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Sean. Oh, thank you. Thank you, David. You normally give longer introductions. Do I? <laughs> thank you, you Right. <laughs> OK, well, many thanks to everyone who's come to fill this room this evening. I do always enjoy coming to address the Libertarian Alliance, and um, I hope that I shall continue to be welcome at future meetings. I've agreed to talk this evening about the value of tradition, and perhaps about its challenge to certain conceptions of libertarian purity. Let, let me begin let me begin with the custom of washing our hands after we use the lavatory. I, I won't ask whether you all do that because we all do. of you all of you would insist <laughs> vehemently that you always wash your hands after using the toilet. Uh, apparently there is limited truth in that claim. M many years ago, some researchers um, stopped people as they came for a gentleman's urinal, asking, did you wash your hands after, after relieving yourself? 100% of the people said yes, but if you look at the amount of soap used, um, somewhat less than 100% probably washed their hands. Regardless of that fact, we have all been told as children that we should wash our hands after using the toilet. If we have children of our own, we impress that on them at the earliest age and, and nag them about it. And the question, a question worth asking, is why this particular custom? We know nowadays that um, if you do not wash your hands after using the toilet, uh, all manner of microorganisms and toxins get onto our fingers and if we then if we then eat something we may re-ingest these we also know that if other people don't wash their hands after using the toilet and we eat something that they have touched then we may ingest their microorganisms and their toxins however this is something that we've only known properly since the 1860s, since the experiments of Pasteur. Yet the custom of hand washing long predates the 1860s. It is a, it is a fundamental point among many civilizations, I mean, indeed among all civilizations, regardless of their scientific understanding, which as I said before the 1860s in this respect, was uh, decidedly lacking. And, and so why is it that we are supposed to wash our hands after using the toilet? You might say that a long time ago, um, a, a person of great brilliance, or several people in different places and different times of great brilliance, uh, observed that people who were somewhat uncleanly in, in their toilet habits tended to come to a bad end, but, but I'm not sure that that is the case. Um, I, I, I think the custom arose not by direct teaching, but by a kind of evolution. Let me move away from washing our hands after using the toilet to perhaps a, a more interesting case study. The there was a revolution in China in, I believe, 1911, when the Manchu dynasty fell and was replaced by a republic. Now, so long as the Manchu emperors were in charge of China, Manchuria itself <coughs> was closed to the Chinese. It was an enormous park for the Manchu emperors. Phil Manchuria was reserved for the Manchu emperors and for the native Manchurians. Now, in 1911, when the Chinese Empire fell 
and was replaced by a European-style republic, this prohibition lapsed. And large numbers of ethnic Chinese flowed into Manchuria. And the reason they went to Manchuria was because the native Manchurians had long since had a very lucrative um, business. They would trap marmots. Never seen one, but I understand that they're rodents with a rather beautiful coat. Uh, the native Manchurians would trap marmots and sell the fur. And the ethnic Chinese, now that the prohibition was lifted, flowed into Manchuria to do some trapping of their own. Now the natives told them, oh, you know, we have a custom, if, um, if one of those marmots looks a bit iffy, we don't, um, we, we don't trap it, we just leave it, um, we let it go again. And, and indeed, quite often what we do is we up our tents and move several miles down the valley. And the native Chinese said, oh, stuff and nonsense, this is a ridiculous superstition. Look, these creatures have perfectly usable furs. Uh, and so the ethnic Chinese trapped the marmots. And unfortunately, many of them contracted bubonic plague, which um, spread back into China and down towards Hong Kong. And if, almost by chance, modern scientists had not discovered in 1896 exactly what the transmission mechanism was for bubonic plague, then if it had not been, if it had not been for the fact that uh, by 1911 we, we knew the transmission mechanism for bubonic plague, then that plague might have spread along the trade routes probably not as a repeat of the Black Death, but it would have killed many more people than it did. We can understand perfectly well what had happened. The marmots were carrying fleas, which in turn were infected with the Pastorella eosina. The um, Chinese allowed the fleas to jump from the dead marmots onto their own skin, onto their own bodies. They were bitten by the fleas, the bacillus was transmitted, and many of them caught and, and died from the bubonic plague. And this was obviously the reason for these Manchurian customs about the avoidance of marmots which looked a little unwell. How did the Manchurians discover this very important truth? Again, was there some Manchurian lawgiver of supreme brilliance in the distant past who observed things about the transmission of bubonic plague that, that escaped every Western scientist until 1896? I, I don't think that was the case. What is likely to have happened is that at some time in the distant past, the Manchurians decided, some Manchurians decided, probably at random, that in a marmot which looked a little ill dwelt the spirits of their ancestors, and it would show great disrespect to their ancestors if they were to trap and kill these animals. This is an hypothesis, I don't know if it's true. But if something like that happened, then one can assume that this originally arbitrary, I I random um, claim was justified by events. Not in the sense that the Manchurians said, hey, this, you know, this prejudice must be true. W what is much more likely to have happened is that those Manchurians who did not share this belief about um, the need to leave ill marmots alone, died. They didn't have children. They didn't pass on their scepticism about this particular myth. And instead, those Manchurians who did accept the myth, they lived, they reproduced, and along with the reproduction of children was the continuation of the myth. Not one 
Manchurian you might have asked in 1911 could have explained to you why they had come up with this particular belief. All they could say was, it is our ancestral custom. Nobody had ever been able to explain the value of that particular custom. All that had happened, as I said, is that those people who adopted the custom didn't die, they had children and passed on the custom. Those people who are skeptical about the custom tended to die and therefore not to reproduce. Uh, and so as the generations went by, more and more people in Manchuria came to accept that particular custom. I, I could give any number of other possible instances, but I, I think those two will be enough. What we can say, or what I will say, is that custom is often uh, a kind of crystallised reason. There is often in customs, no matter how apparently bizarre they may seem to an outsider, no matter how unsupported by anything that we would regard as scientific or even common sense evidence, there may be a great deal of truth in these customs. Uh, and this being so, when we find ourselves confronted by a custom, a custom of foreign peoples, or indeed a custom of our own that we cannot justify in reason, then our response is not to reject it as so much rubbish from the past, to be cleared away on our progress to a, a more enlightened and more scientific future. We should give it the benefit of the doubt. <coughs> there should always be a rebuttable presumption, as the lawyers call it, in, in favour of custom. I, I, indeed, it may even be argued that there should be an irrebuttable presumption in favour of custom that just because we cannot justify something in reason it is no excuse, is no cause for rejecting it. Now in his, introduction, in his introductory comments um, which started before the camera began <coughs> to roll, David mentioned Hume and Burke. Uh, and of course this is one of the central points in Burke's reflections on the French Revolution. There was a bankruptcy in 1788 of the French monarchy um, for various political reasons. The government was obliged to call the first meeting in nearly 200 years of the Estates General. The Estates General were filled with men who had no particular respect for the customs and institutions of their own country and who took the opportunity that a financial difficulty the government had given them to reform France from top to bottom. Yet, instead of moving directly to a, a state of in enlightened scientific reason, <coughs> France went through a period of insane terror. Uh, and Bert's point is, that the French had been ridiculously unwise in their root and branch reforms of their country. They had destroyed the foundations of order and morality. They had not intended to, but that is what they did. Now, how does this affect us as libertarians? How does, it, how does it affect us as intelligent, educated men and women? Let me take the first part of that question. We as libertarians do, or are supposed to, embrace the non-aggression principle. If something is purely self-regarding, if it does not involve 
an assault against the life, liberty and property of others, if it does not involve fraud, then it is um, no worse than indifferent. It, it may be good, it may be indifferent, but it is not something that um, any of us should wish to control by legal means. If, on the other hand, something does involve a, a violation of the right to life, liberty or property, it is an illegitimate custom or institution or law, and it should, at the earliest opportunity, be swept away. We have a clear and simple principle. Mind you, it can, of course, be rather complex in its application, but we have um, in its basis, a clear and simple criterion by which to judge what laws and institutions should be retained and what should be swept away. Yet, yet if you look at the, if you look at the value and indeed the power of custom, th this may not. This may not, it, it may not be entirely <coughs> wise to adopt the non-aggression principle as our criterion for the laws uh, or, or the coercive customs and institutions of a country. It, it may be that we look at a particular law or custom or institution and we say this is coercive, this is at the very best, unreasonably coercive, and therefore it must be swept away. Yet in doing so, we may be overlooking a reason which we're not capable of understanding for ourselves. We may be overlooking a reason for this law or custom or institution, and by sweeping it away, we may inadvertently move ourselves to a still more unfree state of affairs. That, that is a, an observation for libertarians. What about, how does this affect enlightened, reasonable men and women? Let us take, let us take the institution of slavery. Now, I don't think that there is any of us in this room who believe that slavery, chattel slavery, is in any sense a supportable institution. And we would have no hesitation if we were to come to power in a country where slavery existed in freeing the slaves at the earliest opportunity. <clears throat> this being said, Slavery has existed in all places at all times. Slavery existed among every ancient people of which we have knowledge. There were slaves in Babylon, there were slaves in Assyria, there were slaves in Egypt, there were notoriously slaves in Rome and in Greece, and there were slaves in Islam, and there were slaves in China and Japan, there were slaves in South America, uh, the civilizations of which were, so far as we can tell, completely isolated from our own. Slavery is a universal institution. Its abolition only became a serious, it only became a, a serious matter to argue about 300 years ago. Um, and indeed, many of the anti-slavery campaigners in this country were regarded not simply as inconvenient to certain commercial interests, they were considered to be insane. Slavery is mentioned and not condemned and, and therefore arguably justified in the Bible and in the Quran and in just about every other religious text you can imagine. Slavery was justified, uh, given a full formal justification by Aristotle. And yet you had these men in the 18th century talking about the abominable cruelty, the illegitimate institution of slavery. And 
when the argument had been won in this country, it was by no means won in all other countries. There were many times in the 19th century when uh, the Royal Navy's zeal in stopping the slave trade brought us to the edge of war with various European powers and on a number of occasions with the United States. And when we were able to stamp slavery out in places like Africa and Asia, the, the people whose slaves were taken away were not merely aggrieved and angry, they were astonished. What on earth are the British doing to take our slaves away from us? Slavery is an ancient, and as far as most peoples have been concerned in all times and places, an entirely illegitimate institution. Surprisingly few slaves have ever been against the institution of slavery. They were certain they may have been against their own enslavement, but they were not against the institution of slavery. I indeed, in Rome, it was quite common for slaves to be freed, to become freedmen. And then, if they worked hard, if they made themselves rich enough, they would become slaveholders in their own right. They were freed black in the American South who were slaveholders. Very few people thought ill of slavery. As I said, slaves thought ill of their own enslavement but not of the institution of slavery itself. And so slavery is as ubiquitous and as old an institution as washing our hands after using the toilet. And we might all agree that slavery is a thoroughly evil institution, but is it not possible that there is a justification for slavery that we have simply not ourselves been able to find? Now, for the well, avoidance of justification for anything. Ah, but no, David, for the avoidance of doubt, I'm not recommending the reintroduction of chattel slavery. What I'm saying is that custom is often crystallized reason. Slavery is a ubiquitous custom, and therefore, what reason have we for saying that there is no crystallized reason in slavery? Or I might turn to I might turn to the custom of human sacrifice. This again is ubiquitous. It has existed in most times and places. It, it is not simply a, a custom of Stone Age savages or of um, rather picturesque Aztec and Inca civilizations or what have you. Human sacrifice was practiced on the quiet by the Greeks, it was practiced on the quiet by the Romans, it was practiced in the open by the Carthaginians, by no means unenlightened and uncivilized, uh, in any sense, backward peoples. S human sacrifice appears to have been practiced by the very ancient Jews. Remember the story of, um, is it Jacob who is called on to sacrifice Isaac? I really can't remember. Yes, yes, yeah. yes it's a long time since I sloped off Sunday school, but... Um, it's Abraham, isn't it? Abraham. Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, Abraham and yes, Isaac, forgive course. me, that's yes. the one, yes. The ram and the thicket. That's <laughs> it, yes. Of course, God is a liberal, of course. Well, uh, God is not going to let him. Uh, kill his son. <laughs> yes, he just um, he just wants to see that he's obedient. Yes, I know, but uh, <laughs> the fact that the story is told it, it indicates that <clears throat> in their very early history, the Jews may have had no particular objection to human sacrifice, <laughs> along with many other peoples. And so, again, we can look at the justifications given for human sacrifice. Oh, we, you know, we have to sacrifice a virgin every April because otherwise the rains won't fall or the crops won't grow. And we can laugh at those justifications. We sacrificed three warriors in order to guarantee our success in battle. Again, you can laugh at that. You can say, what unenlightened 
uncivilized people. How brutal, how, how terrible. And yet again, is it not possible that there is some hidden rationality in the practice of human sacrifice? Uh, and so, if you are any kind of conservative, and if you believe in the value of tradition, we're not simply talking about the custom in this country whereby judges wear horsehair wigs and so do barristers. We're not talking about um, rather genteel, civilized customs of that nature. Where is the criterion? Where do we draw the line? We may justify the survival of the English system of weights and measures on the grounds that it is customary, and custom may contain all manner of hidden reasons which we are not capable of understanding. But if you accept that argument, how are you not to accept the legitimacy of slavery or human sacrifice? Now again, you could say, well, I'm a libertarian. I do not accept the supreme value of custom. I'm willing to give the occasional nod to it, but my mind works on entirely different principles. But, but I have said that um, it, it is obviously the case in our everyday lives that custom is valuable and even those customs, or especially those customs which we were not until recently able to justify by any scientific means. And uh, I, I come back to my opening point uh, about the value of washing our hands after going to the toilet. Until the 1860s, nobody would have been able to give a satisfactory justification for this custom. We know the justification now because we live after Pasteur had done his work. But before the 1860s, if you'd asked, well, why should I wash my hands after using the toilet? You would not have been given a very satisfactory answer. So I might have said, well, it makes your fingers smell. Yes, but in those days, most people were rather dark, dirty, and it wasn't just their fingers that smelled. And so, I haven't come here tonight to give a speech in which I raise a question and answer it. I've come here to ask a question. I suggest that we cannot ignore custom. We, 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 cannot, we cannot fail to respect custom in general. I, I've given a number of cases in which um, Customs which we were not until recently able to justify have saved many millions of lives. And yet a general argument in favour of custom might well shut down most discussions of how to achieve a, a more libertarian society than the one in which we live. And so with those words, how long have I spoken? Half an hour. Half an hour, yeah. <coughs> I said half an hour, and I've done half an hour. Over to you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I think we want to have a point of information uh, before we go into the discussion. Um, human being is antiseptic, and if you wash your hands after you've uh, urinated, you'll make them more dirty rather than more cleaner. It was used by Lister, Joseph Lister, as an antiseptic in hospital. So urine is cleaner than, but Shaw says it does smell. So that's a good reason to wash your hands after you've urinated. Uh, but you'll make them dirtier and they'll be less hygienic. Uh, is there any, well, I any... wasn't thinking of urination. <laughs> well, you did mention urination. You said that, yes. uh, that many people who went to the uh, 
uh, come to a bad toilet yeah. uh, uh, after they urinated had not washed their hands yes. because we could see they hadn't used enough soap. Uh, but if they had used soap, their hands would be dirtier from a medical point of view. But anyway, uh, is there any a path? Yeah, I mean, is it, isn't the death penalty a form of sacrifice? Surely, I mean, it's kind of quasi-religious, moral kind of thing, isn't it? A death penalty. I mean, I've never been able to establish a, a, a great difference between the two. No, there may not be much difference between the two if um, you consider it in that light. And just to, just to come on to that, the next thing, I mean, the ancient African tribes, so I'm told, uh, I haven't verified this myself, but people who were condemned to death in tribes apparently had the option of being slaves instead of dying. And these slaves were sold to colonies and so forth. I mean, the people executed for whatever death penalty were never given that option here. Did they want death or slavery? I mean, if they'd have chose slavery instead of death, then why is that such slavery such a bad thing? I could never understand that. Yes, well, actually... Why weren't they given the choice that those Africans were given uh, hundreds of years ago, which everybody seems to rail about now. Although, I mean, surely, you know, being yeah. a slave is better than being dead. Yes, well, Could be wrong on that. Uh, until the... Uh, until the end of the 18th century, uh, in fact, well into the 19th century, forgive me, um, although you didn't have the option of death or enslavement, uh, the choice was made for many condemned criminals of slavery that they were transported to the colonies. Yeah. And a few of them were given the option. You know, now and again, it is the other place where they were given the option, transportation for life or death penalty. But as yes, Sean said, you know, not always. Nico? Yeah, I mean, I, I can certainly follow you in the sense that uh, I, I agree we shouldn't completely uh, swap away everything uh, uh, that any, any custom that we uh, that we have uh, from 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 previous generations, like they did in the uh, French Revolution and so on. So this very radical approach of getting rid of it is probably not the right thing. But at the same time, I can't quite respect customs and and, and, tra and traditions f just for being traditions. Because I, I think any kind of theory always needs to be constantly tested if it if it really is is accurate. Even if you're just doing it carefully and 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 with the with the uh, with the real intention of of trying to test uh, whether it's it's good or not, and and with the open mindedness that it might come out that it is actually a good tradition, uh, that, that 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 might be good. But ultimately. <coughs> Sure, there are some some really valuable traditions that turn out afterwards uh, after we know a lot more to be really really brilliant, brilliant. But there's there's also there's also an awful lot of, of superstition uh, and and traditions that come from just misinterpretations of events and and to find out which are the good traditions and which are the bad traditions, the only method that that we have is trying to test the waters a little bit and sometimes breaking these traditions, see what happens. And uh, and I think that there's, there's a lot of value in this because otherwise we're stuck with all traditions and and uh, we, we're compiling a lot of, of, of really, really bad ones. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, that's an observation on a question, yes. Is there any more questions? Sorry, have I been... Hmm? Would you like to say some more? Yes. No, no, Nick has made a comment, not, not raised a question. Um, what would you say about um, religious traditions from the Middle East, which we could look at now and clearly say that there was originally a health reason, I'm talking about the religious slaughter and um, the uh, religious edicts not to eat swine and things like that. We now know that pigs go off very quickly, but we've now got refrigeration methods but because it's religiously enshrined, people hold on to that tradition as they think it was, they believe it was given from God. But we can look at the, all the, the animals which they, um, which are, we're told not to eat, and there's very good medical reasons. Mm. We, before refrigeration, you wouldn't eat those. Mm. And it's the same with circumcision, you could argue that people would get infections, so it would really stop that. Yeah. Well, what you're saying, Oliver, is that um, many of these apparently bizarre and arbitrary traditions had 
some had a justification which we're now well capable of appreciating. It, um, but there's no justification now in that sort of medical sense, is there? Well, there's no justification Health in the sense. medical sense, but uh, just because we have found one reason for a custom doesn't mean that we have satisfactorily explained it. Um, let me. Th ah, yes. Now, I don't. I, I've never bothered reading the Quran. Um, a confession which may shock and outrage some of you, but um, in my Sunday school days, I did have to go through things like Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and many of the customs of the ancient <coughs> Jews, which I think are still kept up by some modern Jews, strike me as bizarre, as absolutely without foundation. Isn't there? Isn't there a Jewish? Um, prohibition of wearing clothes made of two different fibres. That's in our Bible as well, that's in the Christian Bible as well. Oh yes, it's, yeah. it's in the Old Testament. Now that strikes me as so stupid that I would never under any circumstances stop wearing my cotton and polyester mix jumpers or what have you. But if you look at many other of these Jewish customs, and you've just mentioned them, the prohibition of eating pork and shellfish in super hot climates where stuff goes off in a matter of hours, um, the insistence on circumcision in very hot and dusty climates where, where people didn't wear underclothes and where you could get some rather nasty infections. Now those make perfect sense when you look at them from a medical and a scientific point of view. But the point is, who are we to say, who are we to say, that even the prejudice against wearing clothes of mixed fiber is entirely senseless? And as I said, just because we have given an explanation for the prejudice or the prohibition against eating pork and shellfish, does that mean that we have completely exhausted the reasons why this custom existed. I don't know. Indeed, if you look at religion itself, um, there are people who are insistent that God does not exist. I in, indeed, um, if you look at all of the rational arguments for the existence of a supreme being, the most you can say is not proven. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't exist, I'm just saying that the arguments that purport to prove his existence do not seem to work very well. Does that mean that we should reject religion? Does that mean that we should preach atheism? Um, I'm not at all sure of that. There, there is a story, and most stories about him are apocryphal, but there is a story about Voltaire. One day, one evening rather, he was enjoying a convivial dinner with his friends, uh, and one of his dinner guests made an anti-religious joke, at which point Voltaire stood up, he silenced his friend, and he gathered the servants together, ushered them from the room, locked the door, sat down and said, mm, you may continue, but speaking for myself, I do not wish to be murdered in my bed tonight. The meaning being that religion is needed to keep the common people in line. If you preach atheism to the uneducated, they will, um, they will lose all sense of morality. Of course, atheism is entirely safe among the educated classes because, because our moral feelings are based on entirely <coughs> different grounds. That could have been the 18th century deist or atheist conception. But it seems to be it seems to have been fairly well established during the past 250 years that when even the educated en masse become militant atheists, they do not end up showing very much respect for the life, liberty and property of others. Uh, yeah, so couldn't you use that reasoning to justify any action? Uh, for example, like I could decide on the 1st of January, I could go around and shoot people, and that's a tradition. And there you go. You've got, you can't have no, no standard by which you can say, well, this is not a valuable tradition because maybe there's some hidden value somewhere. And in that sense, I could 
essentially do it, people would justify anything they do. So I don't know if, if you really can use it as a, it has any use really, in that sense. Because if you don't have a standard by which to filter it, you can justify anything. Well, yes, if you, um, if you can show that a purge on the 1st of January is an immemorial tradition, um, we do, or at least I have, a problem. I, I might well say, no, this should be stopped. But no, but I decide it's a tradition. Oh, well, if you decide... No, no, you can't decide if something's a tradition. It needs to be decided by large numbers of people over a long time. Well, how many? And how, how much time? What, what is the standard to Search define me a tradition? Since, since time out of mind. Well, because people have forgotten who started a particular tradition doesn't make it... You know, doesn't give it some some magical property suddenly that would differentiate it from me deciding today that tradition is that I shoot everyone. Oh, it does. I'm afraid it does. Um, if you decide to go murdering people on the first of January, you are a criminal. You'll be disarmed, tried, convicted, and locked away. But if this, if if it is a custom practiced since time out of mind to go around shooting each other on the 1st of January, uh, I'm afraid that there is so at is least it, a weak bias is it, it's in favour. It's ability to, to survive over time, which yes. would give it that. Yes. So if, some, if a tradition, whatever it is, mm. survives, then in your in, in that reasoning then it's justified in some I'm not way. saying it is justified. It might be justified in some potential way, possible yes. way. Yes. yes. Uh, and bearing in mind the <coughs> range of customs that we regard as thoroughly nasty uh, and worth suppressing, um, you know, th th there is a problem. Well, um, the trouble with respecting uh, established things is it now makes Tories of the Labour Party. And I, I should think of the Conservative Party as well. NHS, wonderful thing, oh, wonderful institution must be preserved. Taxing people, oh, yes, we cannot allow making the qualities of income. So don't suppose that being um, in love with established institutions and established practices makes people um, sensible because, in fact, they're being Tories without knowing a reason for it, but being Tories works because you're sticking up for institutions that work. But it also makes you stick up for institutions that don't work as with the Labour Party, yeah. and the Conservative Party, yeah. and the Liberal Party, or the, whatever yes. they're called. And indeed the state. Quite. Yes, well, the National Health Service has not existed since time out of mind, but I cannot think of a single territory settled by Europeans where there has not been some compulsory, compulsory funded care for the poor and the sick. Um, in, in, the dis in the recent past, this was not as generous as it is nowadays, not because we were not in those days socialists, but simply because we were a great deal poorer. Uh, and so, although the existence of the National Health Service cannot be regarded as a custom, um, the existence of some degree the existence of some kind of welfare and health safety net is an immemorial custom of at least European peoples. And um, so again, is or ought to be subject to a bias in its favour. There were free hospitals, of course, but not the state involved okay. necessarily. With the church and tithes, that's, all that is. that's something else. Tithes are a tax. No, it is. And the poor law rates were a tax. And as I said, there has always been, in any territory settled by Europeans at least, and perhaps other peoples as well, there has always been some kind of compulsory funding of health and welfare for the poor. Now, um, it may have been a very bad idea then, and it may be a bad idea now. But it is a custom, and it is established institution. It is an established institution, <laughs> and so therefore, if you want to end any kind of compulsory funding for the health and welfare of the poor, you are arguing against a rebuttable presumption in its favour. 
Two observations as a, as a libertarian who is also a traditionalist. Mm -hmm. The first observation is, if we look at traditions from a libertarian perspective, we shouldn't be so much interested in determining whether they make sense or not, or whether they are even useful or not. What we should determine is whether, at the moment, they are sponsored, subsidized, enforced by the modern state or not. So in other words, very often the modern state comes to crash down, to eliminate certain institutions that were not enforced, mandated, or established by it. And, and I think that as, as libertarians, we should, in this sense, be very careful uh, with regard to the criteria that we use uh, also in establishing whether an institution, whether a tradition is compatible with libertarianism or not, mm. in the sense of what is the um, level of coercion that it involves. Mm. The second observation is that actually, histo I mean, historically, traditions embodied in certain institutions and legal systems have been the greatest obstacles for centuries to the establishment and rise of a despotic Leviathan state that is the one that we face today. Mm. Um, there were religious institutions, there were legal institutions overlapping jurisdictions, local guilds had their own apparently, in some cases, bizarre ways to enter them or to stay within them. Um, and, and all of these institutions, all these, these networks of institutions, especially in Europe, <clears throat> were the greatest and most effective obstacle to the rise of the national state. Mm -hmm. So these are my two observations in, in sort of like in, in defense, well, to offer a standard for yes. libertarians and also in defense of, of the usefulness of traditions. Yes, I, I agree with both your observations. The modern Leviathan state cannot be justified as a customary institution because at least uh, among European peoples, it has not existed time out of mind. Um, on, on the other hand, something like it has existed among other peoples uh, and may have a justification, but uh, let me leave that aside. Um, although the modern Leviathan state has not existed time out of mind among ourselves uh, and therefore is not subject to any kind of rebuttable presumption in its favour, there are many other kinds of lesser, many lesser kinds of coercion which have existed time out of mind. And um, although I have the greatest respect for Murray Rothbard and for the libertarians of his school, I, I think they miss something when they talk about um, pre-modern and early modern peoples who did not have a state. Just because a particular territory, or just because a, a, a specific people has not had a state, does not mean that there is no coercion. Um, slavery, tithing, feudal dues of various kinds, these cannot be regarded as contractual matters, um, even though there is no even though there is nothing that we would recognize as a law compelling people to obey, uh, people certainly have been compelled to obey, even if just by the threat of being murdered by their neighbors. Uh, and so, yes, we cannot justify the modern Leviathan state, but what about all of the other microaggressions, or the, perhaps you call the macroaggression of things like slavery? And I don't know. <coughs> so, anyone else? Of course, libertarianism is most certainly anti tradition. You know, it is the, the whole Enlightenment movement, which I think libertarianism emerged from, is the questioning and the attack on tradition. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that, it should, that the tradition uh, doesn't form a wonderful basis of criticism. And, of course, I think libertarianism and libertarian ideas can't get too much criticism. All ideas thrive on criticism. 
and so it's very good to criticise libertarian ideas and to use tradition to criticise them with. However, it's perfectly correct, and libertarianism, I think, must prove, uh, plead guilty, that libertarianism is basically an anti-traditionalist movement. As such, could it not be the case that libertarianism is entirely beside the point? Beside what point? It can't be beside the point of libertarianism itself. <laughs> Beside what, beside what point? Beside the point of, of conservatism? Yes, it, it may be. I'm not saying it is. But it may be an entirely irrelevant ideology so far as it does nothing ultimately to contribute to the happiness of mankind. Well, what, what, could, what sort of case would you make for that? I just made people, one. Well, well, you haven't. So uh, the, 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 people, people don't like being imprisoned. Uh, whenever the uh, prison doors are, are open, they uh, seem to get out. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, no matter how mean a person will meet, and I've met so many people in my <coughs> life of the sort of silly institutions I happen to go into, mainly state institutions in my early life, I've met so many mean and monstrous sort of people. Yeah. I haven't met a single one of them that doesn't favour freedom. Not only that, I've had the idea that freedom has been their top idea, although uh, uh, they do not consider it in rivalry to other ideas. Mm. Uh, an for example, the Libertarian Alliance member, will mesh libertarianism with other ideas and knock it out, knock, use it as a battering uh, pole to knock out other ideas, especially conservative ideas. Uh, the average person doesn't do that. They uh, are uh, more like me too. You know, more, I'll have liberty and I'll have uh, capital punishment, I'll have liberty and I'll have uh, compulsion to join the army and so on. In other words, they don't. Uh, they're not philosophers. They don't think in a coherent way. Uh, but their top ideal, I don't think I've met a person whose top ideal is not liberty. John? Rather than libertarianism being uh, against tradition, I should have thought that uh, libertarianism would really say, if I can personify it, uh, tradition's fine on a voluntary basis. Now, uh, it's not always clear how far it is on a voluntary basis. I was lis listening to a radio program earlier this week and they were discussing circumcision and one of, one of the speakers were taking the line, no, obviously freedom of religion means you must be able to circumcise your children if you wish. And the other one was taking the line, obviously your children shouldn't be circumcised until they're old enough to decide for themselves. Each of them thought it was obvious. Both of them were appealing to liberty, which was interesting and corroborates your point. Uh, but uh, I, uh, as I said, my major point here was that rather than being anti-tradition, uh, it's, tradition is a fine and valuable thing as long as you can opt out if you don't wish to be part of it. Well, I think it's the Enlightenment which is anti-tradition, and I think libertarianism emerge, emerges from the Enlightenment. And uh, oh, Sorry, can I just say, we've got the issue of fox hunting in this country, which the state has banned against most rural people. I, I have no view either way. Where long, long held tradition has been stamped out, people prosecuted, yet in some countries it's regarded, lauded as a necessary tradition to control a form of pest. Mm. It, I mean, you wouldn't, no government in Spain would interfere with their various blood sports, and there's several, not just bullfighting. Even socialist governments wouldn't touch it. No. So you've got a complete range of different views. Well, I have, I have come across a justification for fox hunting, which is that um, foxes, not all foxes are a nuisance to human beings. The foxes who are the greatest nuisance to us <coughs> are the elderly and sick ones who um, decide to feed themselves by breaking into our hen houses. 
Uh, and therefore, if you hunt them with hounds, the, the ones who are no particular nuisance to us run away, uh, and the ones who are a nuisance get, stop, get caught and torn to oh, pieces. Right. Whereas if you, <coughs> if you replace hunting with hounds with shooting, um, what you are mounting is an indiscriminate massacre which um, it, it is cruel to those foxes who are no particular danger to us and um, also doesn't necessarily secure the objective of keeping our hen houses safe. There's another, another argument famously for fox hunting which is by, um, guess who, uh, Karl Marx's chum, Engels, who, uh, <coughs> who rode to hounds. He, um, he was wealthy enough and he he was a bit dashing, so he, he, he put on his pink coat and he rode off and Mark said, what are you doing this for? Well, I'm, it's good training for the revolution, he said. It's good training. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't Mark say that um, after a bit of socially useful labour, we could go hunting in the afternoon? He did, he did, Something yes. in the afternoon, was it hunting? Yes, that's right, in German geology, yes. And this in string quartet. Yes, he's hunting. We can, we can uh, do something in the morning, hunt in the afternoon. And now we can do both at the same time. Uh, yes. uh, many people say, take this as being the abolition of the division. In fact, uh, our friend David Stewart uh, took that as being the abolition of the division of labour. As I pointed out to him, it is a tripartite division of labour, a different division of labour in the morning, the afternoon and the evening. So it's, it's not uh, an abolition of the division of labour. You, you are going to... Uh... Yes, if I may, I, I would like to expand on the point of the gentleman and, and actually slightly disagree from what you said. I don't think that libertarianism... I mean, again, I consider myself libertarian and traditionalist. I don't believe that libertarianism uh, sprang from the Enlightenment. I think that there is an enormous mythology surrounding the Enlightenment that is, for the most part, posturing. I see libertarianism as something that has much older roots uh, in the late Middle Ages and in the late scholastic period, in the school of Salamanca, for instance, um, where the, there was a first sophisticated elaboration of property rights and individual rights, um, and in the expansion of the Roman idea of dominium and of, uh, and, and of um, you know, and occupatio, the occupation of things that creates rightful private property. So I, 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 don't, I really don't think that the Enlightenment is the starting point of libertarianism. Libertarianism is something that goes much, much farther back. And the Enlightenment actually historically has been an enemy of freedom because during the Enlightenment you see the most radical expansion of governments and centralization of power and so-called centralization, uh, sorry, so-called um, standardization of law, not just in France, but also in places like, like Spain with regalism and Gallicanism. So I, I, I think that there is this mythology of the Enlightenment out there that is not really useful. Um, there's much more than that uh, to the history of libertarianism. And if we rediscover that, we will re realize that the relationship between traditions embodied in a variety of, uh, to some extent, competing uh, institutions and jurisdictions it was at the heart of, free, of freedom as intended in, in medieval and late medieval Europe, when the, where there was civic law, uh, town law, merchant law, canon law, and all of these were in competition. There wasn't a sovereign state, a, mon a monopolist of power or, and of legislation over a territory. So, as this is this is one point, and I, I have another point, but I've spoken too much, so. I, 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 oh, uh, um, I'll see you some other time. Yes. Is it, is it no, no. You should have come to my meeting. No, the, the reason is I said I'd talk for that for half an hour. I did, and because I raised more questions than. Because I've raised questions which I didn't give an answer, I, I think I've given up my right of reply. I, I'll certainly interject, but I, I'm not the focus of the meeting anymore. <laughs> oh. Is there anyone else? Yeah. Is, there? Is, it, is this a, an argument against multiculturalism? Because you'll have one set of people with one set of traditions, another set of people with another set of traditions. I think it was Iceland that's banned allow slaughter or they banned circumcision recently because it goes against their tradition and they have a sort of Western 
uh, outlook on these things. And uh, there are Jewish leaders and Islamic leaders who are objecting against this, saying this is anti-Semitic, or this is anti-Semitism by the back door. But in fact, it's, it's really just a clash of traditions, mm. um, or belief systems, rather. Yeah. Um, in the old days, I suppose, people would move, wouldn't they? The Puritans would go to America if they weren't happy where they were. Where were. You'd move to a jurisdiction which would more reflect your background. But if you have a, an, a state, you know, which people have brought up, this sort of modern, all-encompassing state which will come in and interfere with parents, how they raise their children, for instance, then, then that may be not a possibility. Well, yes, multiculturalism has never existed. Um, the normal pattern of human settlement has been um, monoculturalism. You can talk about the Roman Empire or the Habsburg Empire as a uh, as a multicultural project, but of course they weren't. Um, the overwhelming majority of people in, in the Roman Empire lived in monocultural areas. The, there may have been hundreds <coughs> or thousands of different national or religious groupings throughout the empire, but uh, they hardly ever met on equal terms. That they self-segregated. Indeed, even the great cities had their different quarters. Alexandria had its Greek quarter, its Jewish quarter, its native Egyptian quarter, and um, because we're talking about quarters, I can't think of a fourth one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it, the empty quarter. It does not mean. It does not mean that um, a, a Greek in about 200 AD could walk into a synagogue out in Alexandria and um, be fated and welcomed. And it certainly doesn't mean that a Jew could walk into a, a, a pagan temple, if he was so inclined, or a Christian church and be welcomed. And if you look at the Habsburg Empire, this again, except in the great cities, which again segregated themselves by race, by ethnicity, by um, religion, uh, unless, you talk, unless you're looking at the great cities, uh, again, you have monocultural islands. The whole thing is a patchwork. But, it's, but if you look below, it, once you start looking at the individual parts of that patchwork, each one is, um, each one is completely homogenous. And the reason why the Roman and Habsburg empires worked so well is because they were despotisms. The, the more they the more they tended to reflect the supremacy of a single group, the weaker they became. The, the Roman Empire be, in the East became significantly weaker when the government was captured by Greek Orthodox Christians. The Egyptian and Syrian monophysites fell away very quickly and the Habsburg Empire ran into continual troubles on account of the um, numerical and cultural domination of each half by the German and by the Germans and the Hungarians. Uh, and so multiculturalism has no track record of success or indeed even of existence. Uh, and so people who talk now uh, about uh, making this country, what do they call it? a community of communities are either fools or villains. Isn't there Robert Nozick there? Robert Nozick? Nozick, doesn't he argue for a competing, competing utopias? utopias? Um, well, perhaps that's your point. Uh, that's a, a very um, so long since I've read him. <laughs> a very libertarian thing, a thing to do, and not particularly Tory. Mm. Although, Tories, I think, is a very Tory thing. There would be this kind of place where you could live, and you could live in that different, very different kind of place, and that different kind of place. <laughs> the only principle would be, let people escape. Mm -hmm. Let them go. There was a sociological and classic. Hold them in and right force. Exit. There, was a yeah, right exit. there was a sociological classic that uh, more or less put on in what Sean just said, called, uh, about New York called Beyond the Melting Plot, uh, where it said that people didn't... Uh, as, as, uh, as been expected, people didn't uh, mix and become diverse. They had their little um, colonies. Little Italy, little. Yeah. yeah. 
city states, when well, city states in Europe, people would move out of their own doors and jurisdictions, but people again mm -hmm. could yeah. move between them. Uh, but, but the idea that you can have um, you, you can have a street of Victorian terraced houses lived in by that's it, you, you, you've got a Muslim family, a Catholic gypsy family, um, a Hindu family, a Sikh family, a white British family, a, an Irish Catholic family. The, the That's idea, my street! <laughs> the, the idea that um, you, you can have a community made up uh, uh, in such a way is an idle fantasy. I think it's a reality in London. Well, there is, there is the odd street like that. Really yeah. good, but uh, notwithstanding the fact that the odd street like that, I think in a Italian society you'll get uh, these people who want diversity, I mean diverse mm. places, and you'll get these more Puritan people who want uh, you know, to mix with the birds of a feather type thing, get their own places. Mm. And these will, you know, they're, they're, there's no need for any violence between these communities. They, they can come in and come out. <coughs> I, I was struck when I went to Chicago to visit um, Debbie Steele, uh, how very few Negroes went into the middle of Chicago. You could see them all on the uh, university side of <coughs> Chicago. And, the, you know, and the, in fact, there was de, de facto uh, apartheid in, in uh, it wasn't enforced by the law, of course, in the country, it was against the law, I guess. However, the one side was completely black, and the other side uh, was uh, completely white, and in the city centre, there wasn't a single Negro, although there was a super abundance of Negroes, if you just took a little walk down the road. That's quite a strange phenomenon. And yet, this wasn't enforced at all. We had something similar in South East London when I was a boy. There was something called the colour line which ran up Lewisham Way. Uh, on, on the one side it was mainly black, on the other side mainly white. Uh, I, I think that has now disappeared for fairly obvious reasons. Bravo. Can we thank our speaker here? Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you.